This morning we're going to be praying for our, syn our synod and our district mission to Hispanics. And so we begin our service in Spanish. I'm going to be singing it with a guitar, and then after those two verses, we'll uh, notice the, uh, the melody line played on the piano so we can all get a clear vision of how it goes. Cristo vive fuera el llanto, los anhelos y el pesar, ni la muerte ni el sepulcro lo ha podido sujetar. Todos los que se entre los muertos al siempre de vivir. Cristo vive, Cristo vive. Estas nuevas por lo que he dejado ir. Que si Cristo no vivieres, vi lo fuera nuestra fe. Más se cumple sus promesas, porque vivo viviréis. Si Adán entró la muerte, por Jesús la vida entró. No temáis, el triunfo es vuestro, el Señor resucitó. so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O come, let us worship and bow down. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Now is the day of the Lord's wrath. He is our God, the Lord of 
8 verses 26 through 40. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And he rose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. 
He came to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the Spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, How can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this, about himself or someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself as at Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. This is the first reading. The epistle reading is taken from 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 11 and 12 through 21. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, for many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming, and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them, for he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God is made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that he might live, we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation of our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. 
By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that God, Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he is in God. So we have come to know and to believe that love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear of love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. This is the word of the Lord. rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel according to St. John the 15th chapter. Jesus said, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch of mine that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. This is the gospel of the Lord. You may be seated as we join in singing the hymn of the day. You're probably looking at the title and thinking, boy, I've never heard of that hymn before. And you probably haven't, but the words are just perfect for our gospel lesson today. And uh, we found a tune that you're going to know very well to sing them to.
the strength and nurture of the living vine and the life-giving vine refresh and strengthen us as his fruit-bearing branches and disciples. Amen. And the word of God for us this day is the portion that we read earlier as part of the final discourse of Jesus with his disciples recorded in the gospel according to St. John shortly before his arrest and his trial and of course his crucifixion. It includes the last of the I am statements that John records when Jesus uses various metaphors to describe who he is today. I am the vine and you are the branches. He describes himself and the relationship we have with him. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Oh God, give us and keep us connected to the true vine, your son, apart from whom we can neither bear fruit or even live. Nourish our life in his resurrection that we may bear the fruit of faith and love and know the fullness of your joy, hope, and peace. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Abide in me. Abide in the true vine. Abide in my word. Abide in my love. That word, abide, comes up so many times in our gospel lesson. It's kind of an old word, isn't it? We don't really use it in our, our daily conversation much at all. It seems to be a word that's associated more with church or worship. Um, it's a special word for me. John 15 verse 5 is my confirmation verse. Abide in me and I in you. And apart from me you can do nothing. I always wondered, why did the pastor assign that verse to me? Uh, did he think I was a little too independent and needed to be reminded? Well, possibly so. But then I found out my mother had that same verse and my grandfather had that same verse. So I think there was a little more than just a divine intervention there. Abide, though. What a different word. What do you think of? When you hear the word abide, what comes to your mind? Well, we don't use it very much, do we? <laughs> I always think of one of my favorite of, of all hymns. Abide with me, fast falls the eventide. You know that one. We hardly ever sing it because it seems geared more towards the evening. But Jesus says to us this morning, abide with me and in me. Um, but we don't really use that word. Uh, if you're driving down the highway, and you're looking for a place to stay and you see a motel, it probably says vacancy or, or no vacancy, but you'll never see the sign say something like, uh, hey, abide here tonight. It's kind of kind of ridiculous, isn't it? Or you baseball fans, now the baseball season has begun. You know how the announcer summarizes the inning that just passed? There's one run, two hits, and uh, three men left abiding on base. Probably not, uh, yeah. And closely related to that word, though, is another one that we hardly ever use. Where do you abide? You abide in your what? Your abode. And so we get this image of being in Jesus, being intimately connected with him just as we are in that holy baptism. And that's partly why we wanted the vines to pour out of the baptism font, to show our connection with Jesus, that we're baptized in him, in his life, in his death, and in his resurrection, and we are connected with him as the vine and you and I as his branches. Um, it's an old word, and I think it's kind of an old concept, too. Think about how things are today. We don't abide in something very long anymore. Remember the day when 
uh, you, you uh, stayed in a job for a whole career, 45 years, you abided, I don't know, is that the right way to say it, or abode in a career or a job or worked for an employer. That doesn't happen very often anymore. Marriages, husbands and wives don't abide with each other for the rest of their lives. I've had couples that wanted to get married and they wanted that part left out. They wanted to say, we'll, you know, be committed to one another as long as it's good or something like that. Of course, I would not go along with that whatsoever. Even think of, uh, oh, all kinds of things. You buy a computer today. How long do you have that computer? How long do you abide with it? It's probably not even worth as much as you paid for it before you get out of the store. And then if something happens and it breaks down in a couple of years, what do you do? You throw it away you buy a new one. And that seems to be the mindset. We are not in and committed and attached to things quite as much anymore. Uh, and yet there are some things. I think about many of you uh, new friends of, of uh, Lynn and I who are members here of Faith and Elma. You have been attached and you abide in this church and you've gone through some, some challenging and trying times and yet you're still here. Praise God for that. And you still want to continue in mission and ministry here in Alma. The core gospel message for today is simply this. Abide in me and my word and my love. To put it in context a little bit, Jesus and his disciples have just celebrated the Passover and he's instituted the Lord's Supper in the upper room. They're making their way through the Kidron Valley outside of Jerusalem over to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And of course we know that's where Jesus is betrayed and that's where um, he will be arrested and taken away. And as they are making their way, you can just imagine uh, they're walking by some grapevines. There were many of them in the area, and, and he probably looked and said, see, look, look at these vines, look at the grapes. I'm the true vine. I am the vine. Not, not the old rituals of the law that the Pharisees and, and that the, the temple represented, but I am now the Messiah that fulfills all promises of God, and I'm now that true vine, and you're a part of it. You are the branches. I can imagine that would have meant so much to them as they made their way out into uh, the garden area to pray. I am the vine and you are the branches. And why? In order to bear much fruit. Now, we have a choice as the gospel unfolds. He says, you can abide in me and bear fruit. Any branch that does not bear fruit, that is barren, what happens to it? The vine dresser comes along and cuts it off. We have this end time kind of concept or perspective now. As Jesus is speaking to his disciples, he's talking about the final judgment and what will happen to those who don't truly believe in a, and have a faith that bears much fruit? They will be cut off and what? Thrown into the fire. That image of eternal punishment and separation from God. A lot of people today don't like this. We live in a world that has all kinds of shades of gray. There's no shades of gray in this gospel lesson. Apart from Christ the vine, you can do, well, a little bit. You can do okay. You can do pretty good. No. Apart from Christ the vine, you and I as branches, we can do nothing. We can't bear fruit. Some translations even translate this, you can do no good thing. You can't produce good works of faith if you don't have faith. You can't go it alone. And a lot of people these days, that's what they like. They want to go it alone. You can't even survive on your own. Apart from me, you're dead. Your faith that is barren, You'll be removed, and so you have a choice. Choose the vine or choose the fire. 
Well, we do that choosing by the power of the Spirit to remain connected to the true vine, but we can reject that Holy Spirit as well and choose the fire. But who would want to certainly do that? We can't even stay connected to the vine. We can't just be a branch that hangs out for a long time, doesn't produce fruit, and just stay connected. No, there's no such thing as that in the kingdom of God. You either bear fruit, the fruits of faith, or you're outside of the kingdom, or you should know that uh, you better question your faith at least. There's a lot of misunderstandings about what discipleship means. A pilot gets on uh, the microphone and he's speaking to the people on the airplane and he says, oh, we got a little uh, trouble here. Some of you, if you look out the left side of the plane, you might have noticed one of the engines is not working. We had to shut it down because of some problems, but don't worry. We got three more uh, engines, uh, we got three more propellers and their jets and, and we'll be fine, but we'll be a little late. We'll be a little about a half an hour late getting into our destination. And a little while later, he gets back on the, the microphone again and he says to the uh, uh, people on the plane, he says, oh boy, this is very unusual, but uh, we had to shut down another engine on the plane. If you look out to your right, you're going to see that, but still, don't worry, we've got two engines left and uh, we'll be just fine. We can fly with two engines with no trouble, but we'll be about uh, an hour and a half later. Would you be nervous by now? <laughs> yep, you know where we're going. The pilot gets on the microphone again and says, oh, I'm so sorry, I've never seen this happen before. We had to shut down the third engine. Now I know you're probably afraid, but don't worry. We can still fly with one engine, but we're going to be about two to three hours late getting into uh, the airport destination. One of the passengers looks at the other one and says, oh my goodness, I hope that fourth engine doesn't uh, have to get shut down. We'll be up here forever. <laughs> we can chuckle at that, but so many people think that discipleship can happen with no fruit that you can just be let's say a member of a church but do nothing that you can just be a christian and not even be a member of a church and do nothing now i would say i can't look into someone's heart and see if they have faith or not but by your works you will be known and god certainly can and Mark says at the end of his gospel, we mentioned it last week, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. It's not about doing the works to earn salvation, of course. You Lutherans, you know that so well. But it's about the faith that has no works. Is there really and truly a faith? And it seems Jesus is saying no. So what he is saying then is abide in me. That's the only way to remain faithful, the only way to be fruitful is abide in me. It's either the vine or the fire, like we said before. Stay connected to the power of Christ and his cross and his empty tomb. And how do you do that? Through his word, as we share that word today. And in Bible class, uh, later this week, uh, I think tomorrow night, the women's Bible class. And that's how you stay nurtured in that word and connected to the vine as you receive and participate in the sacraments, as we encourage and strengthen one another as the fellowship of believers. That's how you stay connected to the power. It seems so easy and obvious. A missionary in Africa, he had a little generator that powered a light in his hut. And uh, one of the villagers said, boy, could I have one of those? Could I have a light bulb? And the missionary thought, my, I, I, sure, I guess I'll give you a light bulb. He did. Sometime later, the missionary happened to be over where this villager lived. He looked in his hut and uh, he noticed there was the light bulb hanging in his hut by a string. And the villager said to the missionary, he said, you gave me a bad light bulb. This one doesn't work. It was not connected to the power source. You and I as disciples, we know it's obvious we need to abide in Christ. We need to be connected to the power source in order to shine and to bear the fruits. And apart from that power source, 
We're like a, a light bulb, not connected to electricity. Abide in me and live, Jesus says. Um, it happens to be that if you're a barren branch, you're cut off. You're not going to live. You're going to get thrown into the fire. There is that vital connection to Jesus for life. My father, uh, in the days uh, before, we had all these beautiful artificial uh, Christmas trees. How many of you have an artificial tree? I used to till I got remarried. Um, she's a live tree fanatic. <laughs> And I think I mentioned to some of you, we're looking at a, a condominium that we think we might be able to uh, buy. We put a bid in on it. It has a vaulted ceiling, so we're already dreaming about putting in a, you know, how high? 20 foot? 20 foot uh, Christmas tree. So pray for me. <laughs> so, but my dad used to take the live Christmas trees, and sometimes, you know, uh, there'd be a little hole in the tree, a branch didn't come out. He'd take one from behind or cut one off below. I'll bet some of you have done this too. And then he would take that branch, drill a hole in the bow of the tree, and fill it in in the hole. But you know what happened to that branch? It died. Oh, it had some sort of artificial connection. It was being held in place, you might say. But it wasn't connected to the vine. My stepson is just about ready to... Uh, retire from the army. He's been in about 23 years or four years, I think, now. He's been a, a helicopter mechanic most of that whole time. And uh, he, I asked him some things about helicopters. He said, you know the most important part of a helicopter? He said, it's, it's that mechanism and that bolt that holds the, the prop, the propeller, uh, or whatever they call it, to the cab and the engine uh, to keep it flying in the air. If that bolt breaks and the prop is separated from the helicopter, you know what's going to happen. And you know what they call that bolt? I don't think they call it this in the guide uh, for the army, but they refer to it as the Jesus bolt. Isn't that amazing? Because that's the bolt that keeps them alive and connected. And that's what Jesus is saying to his disciples and us. And he's a saying to us also, abide in me and bear much fruit. Bear much fruit. There's no such thing as being connected and barren. I've had the privilege for the last year or so to work uh, with Greenfields at the uh, various nursing facilities. You know, there's one phrase that comes up sometimes, I really don't like it. Uh, someone will say, uh, well, where do you work? I'll tell them, oh, you work in God's waiting room. I don't like that phrase at all. And, and I think that's another one of those misunderstandings about discipleship. Because where does it ever say in Scripture that we're supposed to, uh, when we get old enough, um, stop bearing fruit? Isn't it the oldest uh, vines and branches that bear the best fruit? I think we're called to be fruitful until the Lord calls us into the harvest time, be it when he takes us from this life or at the end time when he calls us and gathers us together. In the meantime, now I realize the good works and the fruits of faith when you get to the ripe old age of 70, 80, 90, or 100, we have a few over 100 at Greenfields, maybe the fruit's a little different than it used to be but is important in the kingdom, or, or the Lord wouldn't have you there still serving as, as a disciple of his. And so we're called to bear much fruit all of our days. We rejoice in the Lord always. And again, we say rejoice. As we respond to this word and, and to this gospel message for us today, let us rejoice, let us abide in the true vine and bring forth much fruit to his glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us pray and uh, then we'll sing together, rejoice in the Lord always. Gracious Lord, we thank you for this uh, very bold and straightforward gospel. There can be no mistake, there are no shades of gray. You're either faithful or you're not. You're either bearing fruit or you're apart from me. 
Keep us ever connected to you, the true vine, as your fruitful branches. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, again I say rejoice. Rejoice, rejoice, again I say rejoice. Please rise now as we join together confessing our common faith in the words of the Ecumenical Creed, the Nicene Creed. If you're close enough, I know you cannot join hands together, um, but uh, you can touch the vines if you choose to as a way of indicating our common confession and our connectedness to Christ the true vine. Let us join together. I believe. Source of true life and true love, keep us, your branches, in the nurture of your word, and make us ever faith fruitful, filling us with your spirit. We live in cities and towns bearing the burdens of confusion. Self-professed prophets and activists arise to dictate the meaning of our lives. Grant us wisdom in discerning the shouts and the whispers we hear. Help us not to be afraid of angry voices we may hear and the sorrows of the human heart. For leaders in their impotence to stand for morality, for godly freedoms, and for encouragement to the Christians in our land. Open eyes to evil, open ears to helpful directions, and better solutions for the good of all Americans and all who dwell within our borders. Holy Spirit, may your love move in us with power that we may exercise the ministry of rescue, of rest reconciliation, and of caring outreach with courage. One in three, may we abide in you as we intercede for those whom we mention in need and those whom we mention in quieted hearts and silent prayers. Today we think especially of the vines that flow through the people of God in all parts of the world, among all cultures, and especially this morning, the outreach and the representative of the church among Hispanics in our nation and especially in our district 
La Santa Cruz Lutheran Church. Continue to encourage their pastor, Javier, and help the members in their faithfulness and in their outreach to others. Even as we prayed the same for ourselves, we think with concern of those within our church family. We pray for those who mourn, especially the Grotke family, and then for Joel and Claudia, a Mexican couple who lost their baby girl this week. Continue your comfort with Linda and any physical needs and strengthening she has. Reach out to her in a special way this week. Even as we think of Bill and Sally, how they've, I'm sorry, and Alice, how they've abi aboded, abided for <laughs> many, many years, and the difficulty of being apart during these weeks. Strengthen their love for you and for one another and bring comfort to their hearts. We are grateful for what Pastor Kruger has reported about Sally Lukey, and we pray that you'd continue to bless her. And we thank you for the developing health of Pastor Mark Hanchett. Continue to develop his needs in a way that will bring joy to him and his family. So, Lord Jesus Christ, we trust in you and your loving care. We thank you, O oh Lord, for a wonderful meeting this past week with brothers and sisters from Emmanuel Lutheran in East Aurora and our district president, uh, Pastor Dr. Wisher. We pray that you would continue to bless uh, faith in the calling process and Emmanuel as they anticipate that coming in whatever way or potential partnership, however we might proceed uh, in mission and ministry as independent uh, churches or as partnered together, we pray that we continue to go with great faith and seek to be your fruitful disciples. Jesus, we trust in you and your loving care. Amen. For the opportunity for meaningful employment in our land, O oh Lord, as we revive the economy, we pray that we might find ways that we can use our talents and gifts uh, that we've been given to serve the common good of all and to return to meaningful employment in our land and to continue to rebuild the economy and the health of our country. We look to you, good Lord, as our hope in whom we abide and put our trust in you. Send us, as you did, the Ethiopian on his way, rejoicing. To
gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take ye, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
serve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in peace.